you. Uh, my name is Nemo. Uh, I'm from Bjorn. And uh, here is Jan. I'm Petteri from Music Networks. And uh, in Facebook, there was a little bit different title for the presentation, but we did the right to uh, revise the uh, title and uh, we came up with uh, Big Design for Big Data. And Petteri, uh, how big is Big Data? Yeah, in this case it's actually 335 square meters. So um, I wonder if you have those those big uh, wall TVs, like 50 inch TVs. If you want to build a screen this big, you actually need 225 of them to make it. So it's a uh, uh, 1,440 inch screen to fill with uh, customer experience data. So this is in India, it's uh, made for Airtel, the logo is there on the side, and uh, they are the biggest, or one of the biggest operators in India, which has uh, over 1,200 million people in it. So uh, the data and the network, the control is really huge, and uh, they wanted to measure it in an effective way, and this is what they built, and uh, we're going to talk a bit about the design process that uh, made this and uh, some of the other products we made too. So 300 square meters uh, of customer experience, that's quite a lot. Uh, just briefly, uh, uh, who we are, where we come from. Peter is lead designer in Nokia Siemens Network and uh, I'm design director in a Helsinki studio at Fjord. And uh, today we are talking. Uh, we are going to talk about <coughs> Nokia Siemens Network and your really briefly, because we know that you get really bored when you actually hear corporate presentation or summary. So we are really, really, really snappy about that. Uh, and then, uh, what is customer experience management? What it actually means? And uh, then. Your transformation in big organization and the challenges in that one. So, how do you make a big organiz organization to actually adapt to uh, service design thinking? And, uh, and of course, learnings from our path and uh, achievement as well. Okay, just briefly. So, Amazon is a, a pretty big company. Um, 56,000 employees still, although you have probably seen in the news that the number has been decreasing, but uh, that's mainly because of, of the focus. So a lot of uh, areas have been dropped from the portfolio, and uh, at the moment, uh, mobile broadband, meaning that you will be, you are able to get to the web uh, wirelessly at areas of speed so speed so faster. Uh, but a rich heritage, so have 220 years of. Telecom experience, you should read that engineering experience and um, not so much service design experience in there. So uh, that was quite a hard one, but we will talk more about it. Uh, if you think about yourself, I guess in the US lingo you would be the so called served person. So it's quite, li quite likely that many of you haven't used our products directly, but uh, you can also be sure that almost certain you have. Uh, being served by these products. So these, we, these are made for operators and uh, a whole lot of people, actually uh, quite a lot of the world's population, connect to the networks using our technology. And these companies use the CEM to monitor the experience that people get in the network. And uh, to get a great service, you don't always need an interface for that one. It can be like a uh, visual interface for that one. So it can be also providing a excellent network. So, a uh, few uh, words about Bjorn. So, we are nine studios at the moment, from San Francisco to Istanbul, and uh, we are plus 200 designers at the moment. And uh, Helsinki Studio is one of the biggest ones. We have uh, 40 uh, designers at the moment. And, um, uh, we are pure design agents, so we don't have any software development in-house, except prototypers. Although, some of you 
might have heard that we've been acquired by uh, Accenture and uh, I think they have some uh, software development firepower if needed, so that's taken care of now. So, uh, back to the main topic, what is CEN? Okay, I can tell you just a quick brief about that before we go to a, a demo. So what it is, it's an online service for telecom operators. There's um, multiple typical user groups that you uh, can use it. Usually it's been just the, the operations and the operation engineers who have access to this data. It's uh, like looking at the matrix. The data is just flowing so fast that it's almost impossible to interpret by, uh, by lay people and that's how you close your, <laughs> your keynote on the line. Give an hour, no worries. Okay, so yeah, so but now marketing, product, service ma management, quality assurance, customer care, and uh, many other parties have an easy visibility to customer experience, how much revenue different uh, customer groups, segments generate, corporate customers generate, and uh, also the uh, performance, not just the network, but also different handsets. So you can actually compare Androids and iOS devices against each other and see that what should we recommend if we have to also provide a warranty. But uh, I think it's uh, easier if I show a quick demo. So would you please act as my mic stand when I do that? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so here we are on the front page and let's for a minute imagine that uh, uh, we are working for a big telecom operator and we are account managers and Cisco is our customer and we want to provide the best handsets and the best service for them. And they come to us asking that we are renewing our handsets for a, a large set of the company. We want to know that there's so many phones in the market that what are the new ones that we should, uh, we should buy? And if, is, there something, is there something that we should make blacklist? So here's how the account manager would find that out. So first I log in. I type here, just so I'm open. You're now seeing a high field prototype, so this is not going to the real backend. Okay, so this is the dashboard and here are viewpoints to multiple phenomena you will see in the network such as, well this is the highway customer insight, the corporate customer insights we are looking for, but the other things are such things as roaming insights, so uh, how <coughs> foreign visitors see the network, how it's working for them, or text messages, how the data is flowing, uh, even can go into protocol uh, protocol level, checking how different web services work. But okay, so we want to see how the enhancements work and what should we recommend. So we go to the uh, high value customer insights. Here we have the common filter bar. We will select show me Cisco. I click refresh. Another thing updates. And here's a lot of data crunching takes place. So now there's millions or billions of records that it has to shuffle through. Of course there's a lot of indexing and engineering needed. But anyway, when it's done its job, we can go see how what are the popular handsets currently there. So let's click here, the screen scrolls to the handsets section, and now we can see a chart. If uh, it's unfamiliar for a particular person, they, they can look at the info and they get to know that these are the, this is the variance, the typical use, the median, maximum and minimum, so this is what they use currently. To see how they are, this, below that you see the phones that by, uh, have the biggest failure rates compared to how much they are used. So, definitely not these ones, these are not so good. So, what to, uh, what to recommend then? Well, let's compare to all corporations. That's a bigger data set. And uh, now we see what are the phones that all the corporations use. And uh, these bars will of course show what are the most popular ones. So uh, myself as an account manager would look at this list, look at what are popular and uh, what are new from here that I would know innately because uh, that kind of common knowledge for account managers. And these are the phones 
that I would not recommend. So in real data, this would be a part of a different list because we are not comparing for the uh, whole data set. So the answer is that let's take the most popular phones, those would be listed first, but from there let's blacklist the ones that are not going to behave so well. So now I have the information and can send it forward. Uh, this same screen can be used for more technical use cases as well. So if you would like to see how the network is behaving near the Cisco headquarters in Kerala region, again switching the common filters and the whole, uh, whole page will update. And uh, you can also scroll like that. So then you're going to see uh, what are the local area controllers near Kerala. We will pick the one that is near Cisco headquarters. And now as, an in, as a network operations or monitoring engineer, I would be interested to see what are the actual problems that are happening in this area. Here's, here's call failures, outgoing call failures. Let's see how many calls fail when people call. <coughs> uh, okay, so this is, a, this is the answer for an educated network engineer. These are the uh, failure codes and their distribution. And uh, it's uh, separated by network related, in which case it's NSN's fault, or subscriber related, in which case it's the handset fault. Handset's fault. So this further then helps to elaborate the answer that um, what are the phones to recommend and also do something about those phones that don't work so well. So, yeah, so this is a method for really quickly to access data that you actually used to take weeks to get before. There's a lot of manual data shuffling with Excel and MySQL and PowerPoints. And now it's uh, available for everybody. Everybody can be literally on the same page and share the same information. And uh, that's how it is. This is what we use service design for. I hope it's clarified. <coughs> so that's like uh, in a B2B environment and uh, in a really large scale uh, uh, corporation type of uh, service design. So, and uh, that's something that UX that you <coughs> saw just there in that demo. It's, it's something that you don't actually see in that environment. That Often so, uh, better. How did you actually make it happen so that the service design thinking and uh, and uh, UX thinking came to these products? And uh, how, how did you make it happen in an in a NSN? Yeah, actually, I joined there as a contractor in 2009, and uh, I think it's a such such a corporation that there's not much of a design culture yet, it's important to find somebody there. Maybe one of you would be the person inside the company who uh, is frustrated about the level of design there and you want to get something done about it. I would suppose that in some, that kind of a setup it would also be likely that there's not a lot of ready-made code libraries to support great UX. You might get the buttons but then you don't get the transitions and if you get the transitions then it's really hard to make it. Uh, but like in our case, we have a lot of custom visualization, so none of the libraries support that out of the box. All that has to be, the code base needs to be created to enable whatever you design. Uh, feasibility and evaluation challenges, and uh, also creating the necessary trust to have the dialogue with these big customers directly, because in big corporations it tends to be the case that the sales act as, acts as a firewall. So first you need to get friends with them too. Uh, mindset and process change renewal in our case, multi-site, multi-culture, multi-history, all that. And uh, I'm glad, really, really glad that Alta is now uh, actually educating real designers. Fifteen years ago I would have loved the situation to be like that because I had to drop out, I didn't find any design training here, so I had to roll my own. <laughs> Anyway, that's one way to do it. It's great that it's happening nowadays. So maybe we will find it easier to uh, recruit internal designers in the future. But yeah, the other key is to choose your battles. So find something that can be fixed and has an impact. 
If you find something that can be fixed but it won't have a big impact, it won't create the necessary buzz. So this is like a startup within the company. And uh, uh, we did, I would say that we did two pilots. The first one was fairly simple, but it was also easy to understand. It was related to customer care. So it was a solution for customer care agents uh, to see, uh, quickly see how the, the person who is calling, how they're, what kind of service they're getting. And the other had to do with field service management, uh, allocating people in the field where they, when they do the maintenance. And uh, this, went, this went well, so we won two awards. And what happens at this point is that the product managers around, they get this little bit of positive kind of envy that somebody over the wall is making waves and they start to think that how, how, they, how they do it. So this little seed has been planted at that point. And then when Anderson decided to, among other things, focus on CDM, uh, then it uh, just went beyond the internal uh, skills that we had or internal scalability we had. So Fjord was selected in mid-2011. Here's some early internal design explorations we did for CDM. You can see that it uh, looks quite okay, but uh, it's not quite so futuristic as we wanted it to be. And, uh, Also not really based on anything, this was just our own idea of how it might go. So, we wanted to scale up, and that's why Fjord is here. Let's talk a little bit about what we learned along the way. Uh, so, first we tried like a traditional type of approach for, for service design and, uh, and uh, UX design for this project. And, uh, so we had a, a fixed contract and uh, then inside that fixed contract we tried to gather user insights and uh, uh, design forms and, uh, and wireframe and then prototype and present it. But then it really didn't uh, deliver. Uh, it, it felt little too short all the time. Uh, because of the setup, there was a lot, a lot of uh, uh, people in uh, remote locations and the different continents, not just different countries and uh, different time zones and everything. And, and then you get, get the illusion that, okay, we have an agreement of something, but then uh, at the end when you have the uh, design delivery, then you realize, okay, we are not on the same page. So traditional way of working just uh, couldn't, didn't de deliver that communication that was required for, for us. So. Of course, we have worked in this project two and a half years, so we shifted our way of working. And uh, our discovery was that uh, uh, almost everything can be communicated through prototypes, different kind of prototypes. And the pro design by prototyping was our approach. And uh, it's, it's like a uh, shift to uh, uh, documentation to show, don't tell type of thinking. So we need to show that hey, this is how it works, and can we do this? And and that seems to be really effective way of doing it. So how do we prototype currently in a in a project? So uh, we have different uh, type of prototypes. Some some are really low fi and they're really, really rough. So those are for one purpose only. So if you want to demonstrate something like, okay, this is how it works, but you don't need to pay so much attention about the visuals or something like that. Uh, so user scenarios, for example, can be really low fi Interaction design prototypes can be still low fi But then when you start to move towards the uh, visual design, then you need to uh, bring it to the next level. And that, that one needs to be a bit more high fi prototype. And then uh, the development support prototypes needs to be really high five because then you really need to uh, get the details and uh, make it so that the design intention is delivered uh, one to one. If you wonder about the how we define what is an interaction design prototype, feel free to ask you in the end. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have a demo. Yeah, so what does a 
sketch me as a prototype. So one of the things we are working on currently is uh, it's a very common thing nowadays to do responsive or adaptive design because there's dozens of phone and tablet and desktop screen sizes out there and it's really damn expensive to try to make a separate version for those. So it would be great if we could scale what you just saw into all these uh, screens at the same time. But it's such a beast that it's impossible to try to do at once. So uh, how we try to tackle that is by making a strategy for responsive design by prototyping it. So here you see a basic framework of the same structure that you saw over there. I'm sorry, can you act as my mic stand again? I'm sorry, I, I, I do need two hands for this. Yeah, so you can see we have the uh, global navigation, the filters are still here. You have the chart placeholders and you have the uh, quote that explains the data. But if I start to make it smaller, now it shifts, so we have even bigger screen for data. Ironically, because the screen is actually smaller. And um, the quote is now here. Let's make it even smaller and we can see things shrinking even more. Boom. So now the navigation is um, vertical. So we are in about tablet screen format now and this will be easy to navigate with your thumb. And finally, pretty much everything that is not needed in a second, second basis goes into a sliding sidebar. If you have used your Facebook client, you probably have seen this pattern. And, uh, now we are in small scale. So with this, this is it's a collection of all the main components that we are, all the main patterns that are used in this uh, CMUI <coughs> and uh, with the prototype. We can now improve this further and try to find what is the optimal way. To, try to find the most optimal way to make it adaptive and then just adapt the parts of the code that is needed for this into the main product. So uh, that was the example of a uh, low y prototype. So it delivers what it means. It shows how it scales. So that is really effective way of working. So uh, just uh, focus on what is needed for for that prototype. The first one that you saw that was of course a uh, high five prototype, and uh, there was a lot more details. And um, so if we think about the uh, our workflow is create, validate, communicate, and then repeat. That is, that is the way that we work. And, and uh, it's been really effective. Uh, and uh, I, I believe that's our way of working in the future as well. Yeah, although we still we want to improve it constantly. So if in the discussion you have any war stories to tell from the startup world, we'd like to copy all your great ideas. Mm -hmm. Of course, because uh, you need to still uh, think like a startup, also in a big organization. Yeah, especially in the uh, I think it's a bootstrap phase, bootstrap phase, doing the early project. So, better. Yeah, a bit of a, of a more concrete ways of working. So we have um, uh, we have mentioned it about a hundred times already. People, fifty-seven thousand people. 120 countries. So how to get the message across? So we have a, we have a portal for that. The portal is a solution for everything, isn't it? So uh, we have ongoing designs, and it has a disclaimer that this is work in progress. It might change at any time, but it gives the visibility for everybody: sales, marketing, engineering, developers, everybody who uh, has a permission to access it. And we try to be fairly relaxed about that. Um, stable designs are <coughs> safe to be used, so developers will look at that and if they want to know what's coming in the next 6 or 12 months, they look at the, de the ongoing the development thread to get this visibility so they don't paint themselves in the corner when they, for example, do the screens because they see that the transitions are coming here too later on. And then we have an archive of everything, so I actually pulled the first demo that you saw from the archive because it was shown in the Mobile Work Congress uh, this year, I can't show you, I'm not allowed to show you next year's demos yet. <laughs> we are still cooking them, but uh, they will be in the ongoing phase at the moment. Yeah, so 
there's a lot of prototyping, as you can see. Uh, so, uh, how do we work uh, between companies? This is uh, the view from the uh, task list uh, that is transferred between NSM and Bjork. And uh, basically we are in a, uh, we do work in a sprint and uh, we work in an agile mode. And Petteri, uh, about the prioritization. Yeah, we try to be pretty flexible. This is not possible if you would be setting up uh, a vendor ecosystem or choosing a vendor. I don't think it's possible to trust a vendor in the beginning in such a way that you would make an open list of tasks. And let's hope that we can finish as many as possible from this list. But um, it is, uh, at least we have found that it works for us now that uh, there is a stable team. We have just the right people in the team right now that we can trust this to happen, that uh, we can be very open about what needs to be done and what we can leave out. So we divide this into must do, should do and discope categories. And things will go into the discope categories, for instance, if we notice that it's not so important after all. So perhaps some feasibility study in the engineering shows that it's going to be too slow, so then we will discope that. And anything that goes into the must do section, it has to be done by the end of the sprint. So we can only select tasks that uh, are achievable in that kind of a time. And uh, things that we thought initially maybe that they will fit, but uh, they are not going to be high enough quality. They are not going to be deliverable to development. Or we find feasibility issue with them that need more work either by us or developers. They will go here in the should be delivery. So the must do delivery will finish and the deliverables will be then very high, high fidelity prototype as well as extensive documentation and uh, all kinds of material whatever gets the message through. But the design process itself is very flexible because it's really based on these uh, low fidelity prototypes that can be changed. And we do have a HTML prototyper as part of the core team so that there's no silo between the design and the prototyping. So actually, uh, big companies can be at as well. And uh, this is a uh, view from uh, our war room uh, in Fjord. And uh, we use Kanban as an internal tool uh, to handle the uh, design work uh, management. And this, this is the, definitely the most flexible and uh, best way to do it. It looks messy, but it just works. And post notes. It's, it's, it's the post note design, it's the best design you can have. Yeah, I wish somebody would invent a really good Kanban note. We have tried Grasshopper and many of those, but they they don't really feel right when you work, even cross city. So these Kanban boards. If somebody makes a good startup about a global Kanban board, that would be worth something. Uh, but yeah, then how to track the mini details that are on your internal board versus the big tasks that are in the sprint. So for that base camp, it's a, it's a great tool for cross-company collaboration and also tracking the history behind every decision. So whenever the designer gets stuck or he has something that he needs an opinion of or when he thinks it's ready, uh, just post in the base camp and uh, the people who are working on the task can commit it immediately. It's quite typical that there's discussions on multiple tasks on the same day and multiple comments, even multiple versions coming during the same day. And then when we notice that, okay, this is, this is now, this is not, now it, no, it's good enough, let's put it into a high prototype. So we have these little milestones too, and uh, so we can track the whole progress of one uh, working item through a base company. It uh, seems to be working well. Currently, that's the part I like. So it's a uh, it's hard work, as you can see, but in the, in the end it pays off. And uh, about that one, uh, this is for example uh, from Nokia Siemens Network, how the design thinking has been affecting the whole organization. So, yeah, this is something I think. Uh, could be useful to think about in a, in a multi-site setup. So you would have, lo you have local designers, at least one in every site. 
so that there is local support. That doesn't really scale if there's multiple teams, but it's a good start, at least for development support. And uh, internally then, we have a GUI board which provides training, design guidelines, visual guidelines, pattern libraries, but also uh, component libraries. Necessary base code, so that developers know interactively what they are supposed to productize. And uh, then for special projects, bootstrapping design, accelerating design, teaching and uh, design support, we have actually a few uh, contractors we work with for slightly different purposes. It could be their specialization or it could be their geographic location or any other reason. Or they just want to keep us on our toes. <laughs>
to trumpet it around. But uh, maybe I should have oh, more people around that could do the trumpet and then. And I think the same, same goes also in the rear step. Sure. Uh, I might have missed the, the uh, answer already, but uh, how big was the team? Uh, this on team or overall? Overall. We don't want to speak about the team sizes because I'm sure that uh, I don't want all the big companies, especially the telecom. <laughs> if, the, if they are behind the curve, I'd, I'd like to keep it that way. Our team is small. It's uh, uh, You can count it with two hands. Yeah, small teams are effective, especially when doing the contact work. Then I think uh, quite an optimal size is from two, three, four, five people maximum, because otherwise they will get stuck. And uh, if, you, if you want to work uh, agile, then you cannot uh, make the team size too big, because then uh, you lose the speed and uh, you lose the focus easily, even though you will have more positive notes and everything. I think the minimum size for an individual project would be the, the two-person team. And uh, for example, for me, it doesn't always even matter who this other person is. So if I went into a, in a contractor mode into a company and were doing design, I thought somebody it could be a project manager or a product manager or somebody who's been working there for a while. But just, you know, to shuffle the ideas and not get exhausted by your own gases. So at least two. We have at least two people. Um, then, uh, how about user testing? How has the user testing been uh, implemented uh, or integrated into the Agile process? Actual end user testing. Yeah, that uh, the way the prototypes can be used for that, of course, already. So we take the prototype, we go to the customer, we find the people for the test equipment and we test it. That's a, I would say, a pretty viable process, nothing, nothing uh, too. Mm, there's, a, there's actually a nice anecdote about uh, testing and uh, prototyping, for example, that big wall that you can see uh, behind this big gentleman in a picture. Yeah, we, 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 kind, we kind of uh, paper prototype that one as well. So, <clears throat> not like that with the paper, but we, we did it so that there was a uh, uh, this video wall, and then we had a manual back end for that one, and there was designers swapping the images in the right sequence and uh, making changes on the fly, so that it actually felt real in that situation. Uh, and that was really, really interesting, and, uh, and it turned out really well. Yeah, I think also in the hiring process it's important to separate or at least recognize these two skills that some people are naturally better at at generating a design in the first place, doing the field research that gathers insight about how things should be. And uh, others are better at evaluating. They like they might like numbers, they might like statistics, and they like to measure things. And uh, for instance, I'm much more oriented in former and definitely want to hire somebody to do the validation part. And, uh, I have seen designers who are good at, let's say, product management, project management at the same time, but quite a few designers are really good at usability testing and generating design at the same time because you have to be a bit different to do. It's impossible to test your own design because it's the best in the world always. <laughs> that too is like given it. <laughs> you have more questions? Was this a totally new solution you came up with, or was there some existing a predecessory solution or different types of solutions that you came up with? Yeah, sure, there was Excel, there was Microsoft Access, MySQL. <laughs> no, just kidding. There are tools for measuring uh, network performance, but um, they are basically, they used to be just, if you can imagine what the database dump would look like. So, the traditional way representing the implementation model. So whatever happens to be the table structure in the underlying network system that is then shown almost one to one on the screen without much of a workflow support or extra thinking for how to visualize it. So in those systems before this people, uh, they had to start almost from scratch uh, taking uh, 
some of those, there's thousands of APIs or variables you could put on those charts. And uh, it was then customization also. People had to make their own charts. There's very little interaction between the charts and almost no ways to make the data actionable, such as uh, uh, sending the data directly from there to some, somewhere else when the variable can then be looked uh, from a different angle. So uh, I think the major innovations were that uh, we used those hundreds of customer cases that already existed for doing similar kinds of activities. But then we made a good set of default content that uh, we can be quite sure is going to be useful for what they are made for. And also uh, worked out an interactive and filtering framework as you saw that everything is nicely located in one place. The navigation is straightforward, so everybody and their brother can use it. So the answer is no. <laughs> there, was, <laughs> there was a lot of different like things that word. were yeah. uh, fragmented. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the big wall that's totally unique. I think it's going to stay unique for quite some time. It's just out of this world when you see it live. <laughs> and do your customers have the same sort of portal? Do you call it what you call it? Solution or is it like um, tailored for customers? Yeah, there is some tailoring always when it's shipped. At so minimum, they want to see their own work there, but more likely there are there are tailoring. So the prototypes that you saw, it was like uh, sort of like white label service, and uh, then you customize that one to mm -hmm. its customer. Yeah, we have a whole organization for customizing. There's, uh, and there's also, you know, there's local laws, there's cultural differences, there's all that. That's why you need those 120 countries with local organizations to, so they can figure out all the minute details that go into shipping, such a thing. And is it as a new service to your customers? Is it like a totally new thing to your customers? Or did they, did you deliver this service in a totally different way before? The new service that you are offering to them. Yeah, I'm not sure if I understood fully, but uh, <laughs> some operators, or many nowadays, they, they do have a quality department who is doing something like this. So they spend the week from Monday to Thursday gathering the data, and Thursday and Friday they create their slides and Excel sheets, and then they spread it around. But uh, there's no way to do like deep cross-referencing in such a way that quickly showing this data only for one company or only this area. There's no way to shuffle the data back or something when it's already stamped on the PowerPoint and it's there. What kind of uh, cost benefit uh, and, and uh, financial benefit was there, for example, for Airtel? Uh, you don't need to uh, say any exact numbers, but kind of ballpark. Or have, have you measured it? Do you have information? What was kind of the customer impact, uh, the positive impact uh, that we could be impressed upon? <laughs> you will have to go to Nokia Savings Networks and uh, look at the financial facts there. If I bought something, I would probably get it wrong and be in trouble anyway. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, and, and this, uh, this one is actually fair here. This is just like, uh, uh, let's say, I think this is a couple of months old picture. Okay. So, and this is from the product launch. So, not sure yet how, how it impacts, but uh, based on their look, it's, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes? Hey, I have a similar question. I'm Pia from Murka, and I was wondering if you have any good experience to share about how to measure and communicate the impact of service design thinking, because it's nice that we have a buyer and a designer. Here, so different ideas of what is the greatest asset over there. Do you? <laughs> we have our own also, but uh, uh, in a case like this, so we how to kind of uh, get the food inside the door, and uh, because you have shifted the, the focus. Mm -hmm. in, in this one, we haven't yet done measurements. Uh, however, uh, I think in a case like this, you need bit of time, so that you can actually see uh, what is the impact for uh, because project uh, duration for us has 
been two and a half years and, and continuing. So it's like a before and after. That's, that's how it goes. And uh, we have some other cases with uh, other clients where we have uh, situations before our engagement and then after. And uh, based on the different services launched, which we have designed, and then we can see how, uh, what is the value of those designs. Yeah, that, that is a good point because um, I mentioned about the differences about we have. Uh, people who are better at generation and better at measuring and personally and better at the informer. So I think as, as the organization grows, it's uh, something that we should be doing more and more. Actually, uh, having uh, similar products from uh, other, other, other industries uh, is the pretty much uh, most effective way uh, to convince customers of the impact. Uh, we implemented, well, not similar, but uh, very close uh, Talks about a dashboard for uh, well advertising and, and marketing and all that, and uh, using examples from other industries that use dashboard, uh, visualizing big data uh, is is just is effective. So take some industry, use that as an example, and go with it. But if you are interested uh, about the impact, uh, we can probably share some of our other cases for those that are not interested. There is, there is some actual use. There was one question for me as well, because most of the projects that have been talked about here with the breakfast have been rather small, so that actually there was room also for the, the implementation was done inside the project. But here I understand that you know, the, the design project that hands over the design to a big R&D organization, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the code, am I right? No, you're not. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, we used to do it that way. That was the part where it said that we tried this okay. and it didn't work because we would have had the illusion of agreement okay. in the early phases of the design. So now uh, we have a place, like I, I mentioned, uh, where developers have basically one demand access to what is coming from the design department. And uh, if they don't go there themselves, we do have regular and demo sessions. Um, I myself uh, go into a lot of the uh, <coughs> graphical, we call them GUID developers there, into their weekly meetings to see what they are up to, if they seem to be heading into where we are heading in the design side and uh, kind of let it be, it seems to be going right, but uh, then if uh, the engineering track and design track start to diverge too much, then it may be time to have a demo outside the normal cycle. It's, it's a lot of footwork. footwork. Well, no, it's still, I mean, the, the, the coding organization is still kind of, I mean, it, 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 it's still, it, it's the implementation done, kind of, I mean, you say you have a core team of 10 people of that order. So, I mean, the, the coding has to be more people than that. Yeah, of course. So, it's more like, I have to be careful with my words against my yes. getting into trouble. Yes. But it's more like this, that we either have or aim to have a local design team in every site so that the developers can literally walk to the design person and help, help interpret some, some detail or figure out the micro-interactions related to that. And the peer-to-peer -peer support community 